and welcome back to segment two. Should we call it? I want to call it. You know, I was thinking about this during. You really the movie. struggled with that, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of difficult. I don't have an intro for this yet. I was thinking about no. calling it movie night, like literally just calling it what we're doing when we watch these things. True, it is movie night. But anyway, yep, we did another one. Last one was uh, R. Kelly's Hip Opera, which should yep. be coming out soon. Um, but this time we did, uh, what was it? Encanto? Encanto, yes. We will be watching some more <laughs> uh, historical and classical films at some point, but not yet. <laughs> I like this one. <coughs> and wait, you're it telling me good. that Trapped in the Closet was not historical and classical? Sorry, I'll, I'll stick so on the subject. So much culture. <laughs> no, I, I found myself really enjoying this movie, and right off the bat, I actually thought I was... It, in the first ten minutes, I thought I was going to hate it, and I ended up actually loving it as a movie. Have you seen that... I think it's a Disney thing, where they put it before films, and it's like this short animation of two like islands with faces. I have not seen... one kind of seen... sinks and... It's like a five minute animation, five, ten minutes. I haven't seen that one, um, but they used to do it all the time when the Disney Pixar movies first came out. They used to mm. always do like, you'd go see them in a theater and they'd do like an animated short. There was one where like a lamp jumped on a ball. There was another one That's with this. Pixar. Yeah, Disney owned them. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that that's just their logo. I mean, like a proper no, the, but short episode. That that's what their logo is. But it comes from that short that they did. They actually did. Oh a short. yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, the lamp. Yeah, yeah. yeah there was there was an actually an animated short. Anyway, totally off topic. This was an animated <laughs> like CGI kind of movie. Well, no, what I was saying about that was that this felt like a longer version of one of them. To me, I mean, made by their uh, Pixar, uh, so. A feel good, happy, we can animate really well sequence of scenes which didn't really have any underlining plot to me. I fundamentally disagree. You also were pointing out that there's no villain, and I actually kind of disagree with that as well. There was no, like, you know, mustache twirling evil person that they had to fight against in the plot like you would have with Jafar and Aladdin or anything like that. But I, mm -hmm. I, I contend that there was a villain, and it was, you know, it was their own anxieties and their own insecurities. You know what that sounds a lot like? It sounds a lot like the plot of Inside Out, which was a garbage film. I never saw that movie. Yeah, it was all saved by, oh, if we just work together and feel love and friendship for each other, we can get through anything. Yeah, but... And fuck that for a plot. <laughs> but in this one, I actually think that there like, it wasn't that campy right, let's let's go over the plot because the the opening yeah. uh scene um the main character she comes from this family of like magical well actually in the very beginning they it's kind of like a prequel when the she's like a little girl and she's talking to her grandmother and her grandma's mm -hmm. explaining how they had this miracle happen and um that, that's how her family got this magic and then each new child they have like you know when they hit a certain age it's like six or seven they go up and they get a magic door and they get whatever their gift is um and so in the opening scene it's kind of the the rapid introduction of everybody in her family it's like oh this is what my sister does this is what my cousin does this is what my you know uh, other sister does and it just goes through all of their different powers and then it's kind of revealing. Am I allowed to cut in at any point, by the way? Oh, go for it. Okay, cool. Um, okay, no, no, no. You, you keep going for a bit. I'll, I'll... Yeah, just just to finish off that song, um, it's also revealed at the end of that song, she's the only child in the family that never got a gift. She has no power. Which, to me, is like, oh, I've been for born into a family of people who are, like, pro-athletes, right? Yeah. They're all, like, they're really tall, they're great at basketball... I'm average height, so my life sucks. Forget was... the fact that there's an entire fucking town of people who are exactly the same as her. She's like, oh no, my life's so fucking tough because I'm born into a family and I'm not super special like them. I, it, I didn't come it didn't come across that way to me. So I actually had a lot of respect for her because, like, despite the fact that she was, you know, keeping the stiff upper lip, she wasn't bitching and complaining too much. You know, to herself, she had her own you know, internal monologue there, but to her family, she was 
always trying to help out. She was always trying to do the best she could, even though she had no powers, no gifts like the rest of them. Um, so I, I, I kind of took a liking to her uh, because of that. Uh, it didn't strike me as whiny when she was talking. But that first song, probably the most grating in the whole movie. Like, by the end of it, I'm just like, oh, God, make it stop. And I was starting to dislike the main character, which is a bad thing for the beginning of a movie. But then, like, after that, it like, every other song I actually really liked. Um, you know, with a couple exceptions. Um, none of them actively annoyed me besides that first one. And okay. I did end up liking the main character, but I ended up also liking most of the other characters more than her. So the next thing was the ceremony for the younger kid. Yeah. So she has a, I think like a young cousin. No, or nephew. Yeah. No, yeah, cousin. So it's her mum's sister's child. Yeah, so cousin. And it's his night, and he's worried because the last person that went through this ritual was her, and she didn't get a gift. He's terrified she that... fucked up. Yeah, he's terrified <laughs> it's not going to happen for him either. Yeah. But it happens. They go through the night, and she supports him. And then he, he opens the door, and he gets the power to Dr. Doolittle. He can, you know, he can talk to animals. They have a really heartfelt conversation under the bed. And I was waiting for the point where he's going to be like, Don't worry, you can share your room with me. My, my room with me. And they just didn't have it. <laughs> it's just like, nope, yeah. this is my gift, bitch. <laughs> I, I am kind of... I do give the people who made this movie credit for, like, not doing anything too cheesy like that. I don't think that's cheesy. I think they've been living in a nursery together and one of them's going to get something good so they want to share it with the person that they've been living with. Maybe. I don't know. It just it did it did seem weird that those two were still living together and the she's still in the nursery when she's yeah. like she she she's like what, 15, 16 in the movie? The fucking neutral chow garden. <laughs> yeah. They they did show off a couple of the other rooms. The, the rooms were a cool thing because apparently when they get their gift, the room is like customized to whatever their gift is. So the kid has this magical room that has a giant jungle tree on it and all these magical animals and everything. Yeah, he can commune with and essentially control animals. Yeah. Which is, I mean, is, is pretty fucking high up there as far as abilities go. Yeah, he goes around riding a leopard. Mm-hmm. So that, that happens, and while they're all, like, celebrating and partying in the kid's new room, and, you know, like, yay, it's all it's all happening, um, she goes outside, because she's feeling kind of left out, because she's, you know, the, the powerless one, and, uh, you know, looks around outside and sees that there's, like, cracks forming all throughout the building, and it's, like, nearly knocking over the candle that represents this miracle. And uh, so she runs back in and tells one, oh, no, 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 there's, you know, the powers are going away. Uh, the miracle's in danger. And they come outside. There are no cracks. They're all gone all of a sudden. And the grandma just kind of sweeps it away and is like, nope, the magic is strong. Everything's fine. Back to the party. And, um, yeah, I, I did, it was at that point I kind of started getting a little bit suspicious of uh, grandma, abuela. Yeah. Because she uh, dismissed that a little bit too quickly, for my taste. Mm -hmm. um, but she was just grumpy throughout the film. Uh, yeah, what came next? I'm trying to remember. Let's see. It, th th then it's her talking to her um, mother and father about it. And, like, her mother's, like, you know, kind of like, I sort of believe you. And she then... Um, realizes that she's got to, like, she's now, she's going to investigate herself. She's going to figure out what's wrong. And so she goes and talks to her cousin who has the power of, like, super hearing. Like, she can hear everything. Um, and she heard that the person who was, like, nervous was her, one of her older, her oldest sister, who uh, I lovingly titled She-Hulk in the, uh, in my notes. Who Alicia lovingly titled Kaiser while we were watching the film. <laughs> She's just basically, like, this gigantic, like, bruiser, um, and she can, like, lift anything, and... Yeah. So, yeah, she, super strength power. Um, Hercules. Yeah. And in the morning, um, like, when they're having breakfast, and the grandmother is talking to them about things that they need to prepare for, and 
how um, her other sister, not the She-Hulk, was potentially going to have be proposed to by a guy in town, and uh, get they'll get married and blah blah blah. Yeah, she has three sisters. Two, three, two. She doesn't have three. There are th- there Listener, are three sisters. Beauty and Hulk. That's so. That's that. Wait, who's the first one that you listed? Listener. Th- that's a cousin. Beauty. Cousin. Oh, was that a cousin? Yeah, it's a cousin. Who's who's parents? Uh she's from the um she's the sister to the Actually, that makes sense based on yeah, okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, she she comes from the stormy chick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh yeah, anyway, so they're at breakfast, the grandma talks about this, and she's like trying to get the attention of her older sister. Because she's like, oh, you know, you know what's wrong with the magic, don't you? Or something like that. And then the uh, the sister's eye, like, twitches like she's like, oh, Which God. Which she fucking doesn't, by the way. Did she not? Doesn't have a fucking clue. Her thing is entirely irrelevant to the plot. <laughs> I mean, it sort of is. I mean, she's later the first on it person... is, but it's nothing to do with the magic at that point. <laughs> well, she's the person who's losing her powers first. She doesn't. She's not. She she's just pissed off that people are using her. I didn't get that impression. That's like, what the whole song was about. The song was she, about her again going back to the insecurities and anxieties. It was the fact that she's like, you know, she's got the you know the weight of the world and she feels all this pressure to be perfect and that. Yeah, really good song. I think that's my favorite song. I thought I was going to hate it until like the first like maybe. 10 to 20 seconds of it i was just like oh god this is so cringy this is so weird yeah and then as it went on it got better i think one of the things that annoyed me was that the voice actress who voiced she hulk was putting on this super fake deep voice Mm. like it it was like just because she's playing this big character she's like i need to talk like this well apparently have you seen brooklyn 99 right uh clips i've never actually watched the show Okay, do you know, like, the badass Latina lady? Yeah, I know who you're talking about. She voices the main character. Really? Yeah, Rosa Diaz is the character huh. in Brooklyn Nine-Nine. I yeah, had no apparently. idea. I thought I, I recognized her voice. I didn't realize that. Yeah. But anyway, so, um, yeah, that, that song is ends up being pretty good. And it, it came out also, a couple times during that song when she would lose the fake voice and start singing in her normal voice. It's like, wow, this person actually can sing i love the donkeys in that musical number <laughs> the donkeys honestly that was my first laugh of the film the donkeys had so much emotion on their faces yeah. and they were so cute but yeah this this interaction comes when uh, the main character is uh following the big sister around town and one of the tasks she's doing is helping this guy recover his escaped donkeys and so she's mm. like carrying them all on her shoulder yeah uh, let's see. Anyway, so it's it's the by the end of the song, it's just kind of revealed that, like you know, for the first time, the the older sister is feeling weak, and um, like she's still got the super strength, but she's starting to feel weak, which is giving her all this like, you know, uh, I guess performance anxiety. She doesn't uh, doesn't feel like she can live up to all the expectations she's being piled under, and then. I yeah, think... I kind of mostly just read that song as being, she's not actually being weaker. She's just, everything that she do, does, she keeps saying, you know, oh, get to, get her to do it. Get her to do this. Gotta listen, get her to do it. And that's what I took away from it. And it was just, it was good. Uh, I just didn't see the relevance to the magic and why she would immediately associate the house breaking with her feeling overwhelmed well i think that this this the reason i think that has uh, like a a very strong tie to the central like conceit of the the plot is Mm. like i i read the whole plot as this um they're all trying to do stuff for the family but beneath the surface there's all this um you know, either uh, insecurities or anxieties, and that those feelings are what's eating away at the the miracle. They're losing their their 
uh, identity as like a coherent family and they're kind of drifting apart and there's all this yeah. you know negativity in the background and that's what's causing the magic to fade that was my read on it and so her feeling all this pressure and all this anxiety and suddenly feeling weak on top of all that that ties directly into it because that's her power fading either way it's kind of immaterial what makes the magic stronger or not because it's not something that you can measure <laughs> It's true. Well, it's just yeah, kind of a thing that people feel, and that's what keeps the magic alive. Yeah, uh, which is very I think Disney. The reason but, that ties all together is because of the way the movie ends. That's that's where I got that conclusion. Yeah, from. it does kind of hinge on it. Um, but anyway, go on. Yeah, so I can't remember exactly what they happens were next. talking. No, somehow she gets on the subject of her cousin, or no, her uncle Bruno, who's like the missing family member, and mm. um. Because he had prophecies and stuff like that, and he saw something terrible about happening to the the magic, and so and that's that's when he disappeared, and um, that he's she's talking to her aunt and uncle about this, which is what triggers the uh, "We Don't Talk About Bruno" song. Which, uh, maybe I would have liked it more if I hadn't heard some people singing it nonstop. <laughs> Before and after the film. Uh, <laughs> I gotta link you the, the video. I, fa I found a video where they took that song. I, I actually saw the thumbnail, but I've seen it, and I just didn't click it, because I've heard it so many fucking times that I don't want to hear it again. It, it's quite good in the acoustic version. But yeah, I found a video where they, they removed all the background music, so it's just the people singing, yeah. and it's actually really good. You can tell how that's, good the people that got to sing this were. Like, it, it, that's kind of almost honestly the worst part of it, is because it is really fucking catchy. Hmm. Just that single fucking word, brew, no, 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 no. So easy, yeah. so catchy, and that's all that you can fucking remember. So you're just going to have that clip of a single word playing over and over and over and over again in your head. And I'll... I mean, that's, that, that really fucking gets me. That is the way it is with a lot of catchy music, so I, yeah. I can sympathize, but this one I kind of like. Um, so it's it, it'll get unpleasant as it starts or gets stays stuck in my head for quite a while but. yeah that was one other thing i think it was i'm pretty sure it was in canada one of the songs i know certainly the first one they speak so quickly in it i did not understand a word of the first song but that was i think the the rapid fire stuff um going on in that song was one of the reasons i found it grating yeah um, it, there was just no content to it because it was all pushed out so fast that it was incomprehensible to hear. Yeah. Uh, anyway, sorry. So they that goes off on that song because she's asking about him and what the prophecy was, and they're just like, "Oh, we don't talk about him." And she eventually something makes her decide that the the co best course of action is to go into that room, his old room, which you know is everyone's supposed to be forbidden for going in there, and. Um, see if she can find that last prophecy and she does she has a little indiana jones moment where she's you know going through the hallways dealing with rats um jumping over a cliff on a vine she triggers some kind of a ancient sand trap that almost kills her and she but she finds these glowing green glass shards that are his prophecy and brings them out yeah it's interesting that everyone else's rooms are kind of nice and fluffy places and then Bruno's happens to be a place where you can die if you get something wrong. Yeah, Bruno's place... Like, the house was real fucking mean to him. Yeah, Bruno Bruno had the Temple of Doom. Mm. Like, there was... Uh... With rats. With rats. Although the, the rats were like his friends throughout the... But, like, there was not even any food. It's a fucking desert. Where did the food come from to keep <laughs> the rats alive for all those years? Magic. Mm. Anyway, so... Uh, she gets out, assembles the prophecy on her desk, and realizes it's just it's her standing in front of the house, just completely cracked and broken. And yeah. so the prophecy is like, "Oh no, it's I'm going to destroy the family." Mm -hmm. And so she then, oh no, her dad catches her looking at the prophecy, and her dad's yeah. one of the normal people, not one of the magic people. And so when he sees this, he like he's like, "Okay, you know." You didn't go in there. You didn't see this. Nothing's happening. And he just put it all in his pockets like, we won't talk about this. Explain it all in great detail. Yeah. And then the very... Because that, that evening is the night when her perfect sister, the flower lady... Well, hang on. What? You, before you zoom ahead. 
I'm not that. I'm only I only one one scene ahead. What I miss? It, part of the same scene. They're talking about everything that's going on in front of them. And oh, then across the balcony. Yeah, yeah, you're right. That is a a key point. Uh, listening girl, she hears them. And uh, then they're they're going off to have dinner, where they're having the supposed betrothal dinner, where handsome man from village is flirting or is going to propose to perfect sister. A bunch of shit goes wrong. The um, listening girl goes and gossips and tells everyone what she saw. And yep. um, it all culminates in the prophecy getting like thrown right in the face of the grandma who sees it and, it, and everyone sees it. And it's like, oh shit. Things go wrong. A uh, handsome man gets punched in the face by a flower. And, Multiple um, times, I think, yeah. Yeah. Don't and then slapstick. they leave, and it's all sad. The flower girl's like, oh, you're ruining my life. What the hell's wrong with you? Yep. Where, where does it uh, go from there? Like something... Oh! I think she follows the rats that have the, the piece of yeah. the dream into the wall. Yeah, she finds there's a hole in the wall behind a painting. And going through there, it's Bruno! He's hiding in the walls. Mm, and he's and been like... The listening girl never heard her. Yeah, that is a bit odd. The listening all girl. All those years. Yeah. That was a very funny scene with the uh, eternal pitfall trap, though. Yes. I yeah. do quite like that. When they're, they're like, she falls through, like, a crack in the floor, and there's fog below, and it's like, oh, no, you're going to go down into the, like... It looks like it's down into the center of the earth, and at, it ends up with Bruno falling, and... He goes down like a foot and then sticks his head above the fog. They were like just yep. just above the floor. <laughs> but yeah, so it makes sense. <laughs> she finds out he's been in the walls crazy and patching up the wall with like paste and stuff to keep the house together. Hmm. Um, let's see what else. He reveals that like his prophecies aren't like perfect he couldn't quite nail down the one that she had he he kind of tells his side of the story about how you know he he means well but when he saw negative things people blamed it on him and uh yeah yeah uh he i wish he had been just a bit more with testicles yeah because he acts like one of the younger children but he's the same age as, like, the parents. That's what confused me. I, it wasn't until the end of the... I thought Bruno was her age. But it wasn't until yeah. the end of the movie when I realized... Wait, the, the grandmother had three kids. Was Bruno the third one? I mean, I didn't know that the, the, the Storm Chick was one of the parents until you, like, someone told me. Because mm. she looks the same age as all the kids. All the kids. True. Yeah, only uh, the main character's mother actually looks like she might be older because she's got the gray right? hair and stuff. And obviously the abuela. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so Bruno, they, they, the the new Doctor Doolittle kid, animal talky man, follows yeah. them into the wall, and um, they collectively convince Bruno that he's gonna he should help them like complete the prophecy and find out if there's a way to fix everything. Right. Yeah, he does go into the wall with them, doesn't he? Yeah, because they do that funny little joke where he he tells off the leopard for almost eating Bruno's rats. True. And then and, your favorite scene. Yes. That. So Bruno reveals to do a prophecy, he needs a big open space, and so they go to the the kid's room, which is the you know the Jungle Book area. He draws like a line of salt and does all this stuff, but there's a capybara just sitting there, and he he doesn't move. So Bruno just. There's like a little hump on the circle that goes around the back of the capybara. Um, so they, they do their prophecy thing and there's storm and lightning and wind and all these glowy green shit flying around. And the capybara is just sitting there in the middle of the storm. Super just chill. Not giving a fuck. Yeah. Ah, capybara is probably one of the best characters. Um, <laughs> also, oh, speaking Some of... this flavor to him. <laughs> speaking of best characters, something I haven't mentioned yet, which we True. both agreed on... Yeah. One of the best characters in this movie was the house. Yeah. Because the house is enchanted too. Like when they're they it We're can not talk about house MD. No, God, yeah. The house they actually live in. The casa. They've got like the the stairs flatten out, the tiles move around and like 
the house if like somebody falls off a balcony the house catches them by like moving a railing hmm. um, it's amazing how often they would have died if that house wasn't alive it's true if one of them ever moves into a normal house they're fucked yeah <laughs> oh god uh yeah uh, so they they do the ritual and they see uh a, like one positive note in the prophecy and it's like and it was her hugging her perfect sister yeah and so her and perfect sister she goes to perfect sister's Ooh. room <laughs> i didn't i didn't mind this scene too much um it was such a 180 the thing is you you kind of over a cactus. Well, it was. Hold on, let me let me organize my thoughts here. It, I mean, it's clear that these two are very catty with each other. They're like not the kind of sisters that get along. They're the kind of sisters that like fight. Um, I'm sorry, but if you fucked up my wedding day and they gave me a really cool Digimon card, I would still punch you in the nose. <laughs> Well, so she didn't give her anything. She she went to the and that's basically what the the younger sister or the other sister did. Like she went in there and she was like, uh, trying to go trying to apologize and like, oh, let's hug it out. And then the apology turned into bitterness, where she's like, I'm sorry, your life is so fucking perfect. And then Flower Chick is like, Yep, we're done here, and has her flowers and vines drag her out of the room. And as they're fighting and arguing, going out there, um perfect chick finally gets like angry enough that instead of like a perfect flower or like a beautiful vine or a beautiful rose popping up a fucking weirdo cactus pops up and it was like it was like the you know the the crack that broke the dam like it was all this it, I, I clearly read a lot <laughs> deeper into this than you did um well no i get it but it's like the crack that broke the dam requires a lot of other cracks to be there first, and there was shit all between them. So, I this is I'll tie tie tying it back to She Hulk, right? With her, it was like she was holding it all together despite the fact that she had all this pressure on her, and it only took that one hint, that that little thought in the back of her mind that I might actually be weak, and that thought grew into like horrible anxiety, and she suddenly couldn't lift anything, and her power started to fade. I, I see it as the same way with this chick. Like, she'd done everything perfectly. She was doing all this for the family. She was even getting married for the family. She didn't even like the guy. And then it only took that one moment of just, like, she actually finally broke the taboo. She didn't make something beautiful. She made something ugly. And after that, it was just a matter... Then she just started going wild. I would say that the strong chick, when she found out that she didn't have to always be strong, became more neurotic. The beauty chick was like, okay, there's a lot of different things I can do. Which, granted, is great, but this woman just fucking ruined your proposal, and you already didn't like her. Why the fuck are you suddenly giving your whole heart to her? Two, two points on that. One, I would argue that in both cases, it was like a seed of something that had been growing in them for a long time that finally broke through. With the strong chick, it was that maybe she can't you know, hold up to all the pressure. And with beautiful chick, it was like, she was like, I, I'm sick and tired of being, like, perfect all the time. And so... But also, she admitted she didn't want to marry the guy. So, yeah, she was married that she ruined the thing. But at the same time, I think secretly she was like, well, I didn't like the guy anyway. So my sister kind of saved me from, you know, being in a loveless marriage. I don't actually way, remember hearing the part where she didn't want to be married to him, to be fair. Yeah, she she did admit that. Because that was, the yeah. sister was like, oh, you were just, you know, why you, you, you had this guy, he's, everything's perfect, he's perfect. And she's like, I didn't even, I, you know, I didn't even like him. And then she's like, well, then why were you marrying him? She's like, for the family. And that was... Family. For the family. <laughs> it's all oh, about God. family. Anyway, moving on from that, because we've yeah. been discussing that for a while. So she goes wild, makes a whole bunch of crazy flowers and explosions and cacti and weirdo shit all over the house. And they have like a, a bit of a heart to heart. And um, that's the when... The candle gets brighter. What? The candle gets brighter when they the hug. The candle gets brighter when they hug, right. Because they're like, like, cause they're you know, healing their wounds, as it were, becoming stronger as a family. And anyway, so she does all that shit accidentally punches a uh, handsome guy in the face again with a vine that pops out in the middle of the village. 
Hey, you're supposed to think he's handsome. I see you doing the finger quotes. Wait. No, that was for the accidentally bit. Oh, that's... that's I, I took it as an accident. But maybe she did. Fucking no-scope him from the top of the house. <laughs> Boom, headshot. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, now Abuela is angry, and so she goes up to the house and... Um, she confronts um, the the main character and is just like, you know, what what are you doing? You're you're tearing this family apart. You know, we need to we need to do this for the family. We need to keep the magic strong and all this stuff. And then the the girl finally, what's her name again? I I I have, I have no idea. I think it's I keep wanting to say Coco, and I know it's not. I keep wanting to say uh, Mariposa, but that just means butterfly. I think it's. Uh, it's. It, I think it starts with an M. Okay, reference girl. Could you find out the name, please? <laughs> so there was um, what was it? Yeah. So they get into a fight, and this is like finally Mirabelle. Mirabelle, that's what it is. Bad name. Go. On. So Mirabelle finally confronts her abuela and is like just, just starts shouting at her because up until this point, like every interaction she's had with the rest of her family, she's mostly trying to be civil and do her best to be part of the family even though she's kind of the you know the redheaded stepchild compared to everyone else um because she has no magic and there was so finally she finally drops that and just gets into an out and out shouting match with grandma and it tears the house apart literally like giant cracks form everything starts to fall apart and then they see the candle is about to fall and so she goes running up the house helps her get up there she manages to to get it and secure it right as the house like everything collapses and the house protects her in its last moments um and just devastation all around i think did, does it actually start raining too I, i'm not sure how stereotypical they went with that but i don't think so she was covered in dust, and the, she had, like, a tiny bit of the candle left. Hmm. Don't know why, I guess it got cut off somehow in yeah. the window. Um, and, yeah. Yeah, and so then that's that. That's what happens there. And the, the grandma, everyone's kind of, like, picking through the rubble, and they turn back. How did Bruno get out? That's a good question. Because he, he was in the walls. I think maybe he does like an escape and I just didn't notice it. It's possible. Yeah. Um, that is a plot point if they don't explain that. A plot hole. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so she runs off, uh, kind of wanders off into the, the mountains, you know, leaving her family, just being like, oh, I've, I've ruined everything. Um, and it was at that point, I think, you know, that now everyone notices she's gone. There's a big search that happens for her, like the parents are out looking um Buela is the one that ends up finding her uh and she finds her up by the river that was where uh they first came into this this valley because mm. they had been like being pursued by bandits or something like that when I was gonna say now I feel like this is the part where they try to inject some real history into it but I don't know what fucking continent they're on it probably it would uh, be South America there's plenty of real events where something like that would have happened minus right. the magic I was gonna say I was like it's cause the whole thing looks a lot like Coco it looks very Mexican yeah um, I, I would say just judging by the geography and um the like the way things looked I would probably guess somewhere in Northern South America, so like you should know where capybaras come from by now, because <laughs> Venezuela. There you go, Venezuela and Peru, I believe. It, yeah, so Northern South America. Wait, Peru. Where's yeah. Peru? In South America. Really? Yeah. Isn't Peru like fucking snowy as hell? There are a lot of mountains in Peru, but there's also a lot of jungles. Hmm. Okay. But yeah, so it's somewhere in South America. If I had to guess, one of those countries. Um. But or it, like a fictional version of those countries. So mm. when the the grandma was younger, like bandits killed her husband, and that was when the magic started. And you know she used the magic to close off the past. And so the the girls up there, kind of sitting by the river, she where her friends rodeed the shit out of those bandits. <laughs> I thought she just closed off the. I guess she... she blew them back. She did. And you're then right. the mountains came up. 
forgot about that part. I just, I guess I was just paying attention to the mountains. So there was no reason for the abuelo to die. <laughs> yeah. So, Grandma follows her up there, and they have a heart to heart. And it, it's revealed that, you know, all this time, all this pressure that she's been putting on, all this, she's been realizing the magic's been kind of fading for a while and mm. has been just trying to keep uh, a strong appearance and just basically pretending it doesn't exist. And she is like terrified that they're going to lose their home again, you know, because she had been driven from her home as a youth. And so, again, it ties back into the, even the, the grandmother was having this, severe amount of fear and anxiety that she was going to lose everything that she'd been built up here. Hmm. Um, and that's... Sorry? No? no that's right. I think there is a certain level of sneaky stuff that they snuck into the film as well. Because throughout the film, there's a motif of butterflies showing the right way, right? Yeah. Now, there is also a butterfly on the candle. Hmm. And I think the clothes that Mira be- I'm just gonna call her Mira. The clothes that Mira wears have butterflies woven into them. I think that's why I wanted to call her Mariposa, because that's it's Spanish for butterfly. Well, I want because I think of her as Mira from Rainbow Six Siege. Um, yeah, no, I'm just saying. But no, yeah. so I think there is probably some folklore maybe about butterflies. I'm gonna guess. I, there might be. It's possible. Or maybe it's just, yeah, she's just always had butterflies, and that's her special ability, is that she can see the butterflies. So other people can't. Yeah, so, movie ends, though, with them all going, well, first of all, Bruno makes a comedy appearance, um, and yeah. they kind of just go like, haha, Bruno, you're such a fuck-up. And then they go back we to the... We forgive you for no <laughs> reason. We forgive you for helping us all these years, and... yeah. Like going yeah, honestly, this... there's no really reason why they drove him away in the first place, to be honest. No, he, he went off on his own. Like, they, they were setting it up at the beginning, like, he was making these bad things happen. But even as they were saying it, they were saying, he told me about this. And so I was like, okay, so you can just predict the future. He's not making the future different. Yeah. Oh, it... So this is kind of bullshit on him. It was very much a, like, shoot the messenger kind of situation. Yeah, don't be the bearer of bad news. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, so they, they go back, the The house is rebuilt with the help of all the townsfolk, um, they, yeah. Bruno makes up with his two sisters, um, also apparently it turns out, according to Reference Girl, that the listening sister, cousin, uh, actually knew that Bruno was in the walls all along, apparently. Oh, okay. Didn't realize Just didn't want to tell anyone. Despite being a massive fucking gossip... As we established, and that ruined the proposal, so... But, they also reveal that uh, Listening Chick uh, was the one who was really... That was fucked up. ...in love with the handsome dude. Why? That's so weird. And the fact that he has such fucking low morals, he just wants to go out with a girl that has superpowers. And so he's just like, okay, I'll propose to you instead right now then. Yeah, I love. her reaction was exactly what would have made sense like whoa slow down we're not there yet did she yeah yeah listening chick was like he he was about to propose to her he's like whoa and she's like no we're not there yet you know yeah it's like let's no, date for a bit, a bit first weird. especially pardon me, especially because the person he was going to propose to helped set them up yeah it's like I mean I don't know what religion they follow down there but I'm Really hoping they didn't fuck already. <laughs> It'd be Catholic. And I'm assuming... So, yeah, they wouldn't have been. That's fine, I guess. Considering how formalized everything was, I, I imagine this would be a no-sex-until-marriage kind of uh, family. Hmm. But yeah, and, that's, and then at the very end, they, they shove a magical doorknob on the front door to the house, and then... <laughs> I was wondering where that was going with the conversation we just had. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, they just shove a knob in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not that kind of knob. <laughs> and uh, I think uh, Mirabelle finally gets her powers. Although, I'm Mission. struggling to remember what they... W don't they give her a doorknob and it's the doorknob to the house or something? Yeah, but she doesn't get any powers. Does she not? Okay. No. I don't think so. I'm sure I'll be corrected momentarily. She got the power of friendship. 
Yeah, I think that was meant to be the whole... Yeah. It doesn't matter if you're not special, because you are special. Yeah, I think they all, they all got their powers back in the end, didn't they? Like, when the house came back? Yeah. Um... Oh. Alright, let's hear Hold it. the phone. <laughs> uh, I am correct. Oh, you. okay. She got no powers. Boom. But she's, she's now okay with just being normal. There are conspiracies, though, apparently. So I'm assuming, yeah, it's like some kind of hidden thing which allowed her to do the things she did throughout the film. It's gonna be one of those anime things, like, my power is to allow all of you to have powers. Yeah, to, to, to not fall off the cliff in Thingy's room and just to be real fucking lucky. Yeah. But anyway, I mean, that's that's the whole movie, and overall, I did really like it. Uh, I really liked the music, minus that first song. I think of the everything in the movie, the house is still the best character. But of the human characters, I'm curious, who was your favorite? Uh, to be honest, probably... Bruno? I don't know. No, 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 no. Sorry, the husband of husband of Stormy Chick. Yeah, yeah. He was, I, cool. he was he was pretty awesome. I actually I liked the two like every scene with the two of them in it. I loved them as a couple because I, I mm. actually was really liking Stormy Chick. She 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 was she made she me laugh more. Annoyed than... me. She was just making problems for people. And like, okay, she was. What, it, what she's... Good does she actually do to the city? Uh, well, she control. She prevents hurricanes and stuff like that. She makes them more. She also she makes yeah storms and problems too. I <laughs> but I did really love that every single time she was the only one that wore her insecurities on her sleeve. Everyone else was like hiding their problems or like they had all these deep seated issues. No, her it was just like you know you could tell she was worried or depressed. She had a cloud over her head and she and they're like I mean, you need to calm down a little bit and she she's like I'm I'm trying. Hmm. I think that's why I, I enjoyed her. It was, she was very much just a wore her emotions on her sleeve. Yeah. There you go. That's the movie. All right. I think. Sorry, just closing. Yeah, thing closing for me. remarks. Uh, if it wasn't Disney, I think I would be giving it a higher rating. Hmm. But I think the 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 animation was good. Hmm. The music was good. The story was... Mm, meh. And for a Disney film, that really doesn't compete with the other Disney films. It is a good film. It's definitely a comfortable watch, which you can watch with the whole family. Mm. But it's not like fucking fire and brimstone like you get in so many... Disney films, where it's really intense and really emotional and music is fucking... There's always one emotional fucking mega song. I didn't feel like this one had it. It had good music, just not bam music. Yeah. yeah I could see that comparing it to other Disney movies. I, I enjoyed it. Um, I actually would put the plot... I think I'd rate the plot a little bit higher than you, than you would. Um, or... or... Because I, I did really enjoy, like, the whole psychological subtext that seemed to kind of go through the whole movie. Um, and But, yeah, the color, the visuals were just phenomenal on this one. Like, it was, everything was just vibrant and colorful and just gorgeous to look at. Yeah. Uh, we don't talk about Bruno's still stuck in my head. Yeah. I think, because, what was the last time we watched Coco? The last Disney movie? Yeah, it was Coco. If I had to choose between two, I'll go Coco, and I think they are actually fairly similar films. <laughs> I probably would as well. Actually, I'd go with if I had to choose between one or the other, I'd choose Coco. Yeah, and to be fair, I did fucking love Coco. Yeah, Coco was a great movie. That was an awesome mm. movie. All right, well, that'll be the final thoughts. Do you want to do your silly numbering system again? You know how many? Uh... Oh yeah, what's it going to be this time? How yeah, many? How, uh... how many butterflies? I was going to say capybaras, but that's a bit too generic because we're going to end up using that for everything. Uh, I will give... Ooh, 
six and a half butterflies out of ten. And I will give seven and a, half. and a half dysfunctional families out of ten. Nice. All right. That's a lot of families. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> One of them was already split up. <laughs> <laughs> they, they multiply. They split off from each other. All right. Ugh. This is going to be the end of our second ever episode of Movie Night. Uh, so look forward to the next one when we'll be watching whatever Blue's choice is. <laughs>